Hello, everybody. Thank you so much for coming, and thank you for being so patient uh, as we got ready. Um, it's a great pleasure to be here, and I'm really excited about the conversation that we're going to be having about journeys and traveling. And actually, uh, Katharina uh, just had an epic journey just trying to get here. So please uh, give, give Katharina and Harry a really warm welcome. Uh, my name is Ryan Van Winkle. I'm an Edinburgh-based poet, uh, amongst other things. Um, and before we start, I, I just want to say thanks to the uh, Canada Council for the Arts, without whom none of this. Uh, we're really grateful. Um, and, and particularly these two, who went on a, a fantastic journey. Uh, I'll just give you a little bit of biographical information be before we start, just so everybody knows and that they don't have to do it themselves. <laughs> uh, Harry Giles is from Orkney, Scotland, and is a writer and performer. Uh, he makes brilliant performances. Their first collection, Tungit, was shortlisted for both the Edwin Morgan Poetry Award and the Forward Prize for Best First Collection. Katharina Vermet is a Métis writer from Treaty One Territory, the heart of the Métis nation in Winnipeg, Canada. Her first book, North End Love Songs, won Canada's prestigious Governor's General Literary Award for Poetry. Her first novel, The Break, looks amazing, uh, was shortlisted for the Governor General's Literary Award for Fiction and the Rogers Trust Fiction Prize. Katharina also co-directed the short documentary This River, which won the 2017 Canadian Screen Award for Best Short. Uh, and in 2016, she was shortlisted for the inaugural Beatrice, oh boy, Mosinar? Mosinier. Mosinier, of course, French. <laughs> Aboriginal Writer of the Year Award. Um, we need to talk about what you did why you did it, <laughs> when it happened, uh, so that these guys all know exactly where you were. Uh, please tell us, tell us about your tour through Canada. It was a really, really big journey, right? It felt very, very big. Um, I don't even know how we came about it, but um, we started in Montreal, mm -hmm. and we took the train to Toronto, um, and then we put, took the train all the way from Toronto to Winnipeg, which is about a day and a half. Yeah, it was a 36-hour yeah. train ride. 36 hours. In, in, in sort of 70s luxury. Yes. Oh, it, was, it had a, that nice train smell. Oh, it was great. Um, and then we hung out, and I got to be a tourist in Winnipeg for a little bit, which is where I'm from. So, um, so we, we wandered around throughout the, the history of the place. And then we went up to Churchill. Yeah, which is, for, for those who don't know, on the, in the, in, it, it's not actually the far north, is it? It's sort of the mid-north. It, people think it's the far north, but there's a lot more of Canada. Beyond. It's called South. <laughs> <laughs> um, but it's on the edge of, of Hudson's Bay, which is that huge kind of bite out of, out of Canada on the northeast. It is a bite. Yeah. It's just right out there, but it's very far north. And in terms of the why, the book festival came to me um, with this project, which was sending uh, Scottish five Scottish writers on, on different trips across the Americas and um, suggested a, a Canadian trip to me, um, I think just because I have a few Canadian connections already, um, had performed there on a tour a couple of years ago. Um, and uh, they asked me what I was interested in doing, and I decided that what would... Um, the most interesting for me was to trace um, the role of, of my home, Orkney, um, in, in settler colonisation. Um, Orkney was a big part of um, the colonisation around Hudson Bay and particularly down into Manitoba um, because our, our, a lot of our men at a time when we were depopulating travelled over with the Hudson's Bay Company and, and worked there. So I was tracing those connections. And then... Um, bounced around in ideas, ideas of a few writers who might be interesting to travel with. I'd recently um, heard Katarina's work on the radio and thought, oh, that would be good. <laughs> and, 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 and then we just started coming up with ideas from there. And I think we just brainstormed so many wild and crazy ideas, yeah. which is how we got on a train. Because you don't actually want to be on a train for a day and a half. To be clear, it's not it's not a, it's not a very functional train. Like it's it's purely a luxury train. It's it's so the line is called the Canadian, and it was it was the train line that kind of that really stitched Canada together as a as a settler state. That, that it was really important to the to the creation of Canada. Um, but now there's no it's there's no use for it as a passenger line anymore. But it has this iconic significance, so it's turned into a luxury travel line. 
um, and well, half the train is a luxury travel line, and then <laughs> the other half, which we were kind of quartered away from we, in a really weird way. It, they were, everyone was kind of sectioned off from yeah. each other. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like there, there was it's it's it was the prestige. Yeah, Isn't yeah. It prestige? Well, prestige was the step above us. Yes, prestige. <laughs> it wasn't just first class; it was prestige class, and you couldn't even sit in the seats. Well, you could sit in the prestige seats at, at like unpopular times of day, but oh. you had to vacate them if a prestige passenger came along. Um, and the, this and this is in the bubble car um, so, so that it literally has a 70s bubble car two of them actually at the end of the train with a huge bubble dome so you can watch um, yeah, the Canadian shield rolling by yeah they're amazing and there I didn't are know eight, those things existed there are eight prestige seats um, of people who've been <laughs> travelling on that line for pleasure for a very long time and they just get brought glasses of wine all day long all day <laughs> Actually. Well, the rest of us scurry in the little cramped yeah. economy. What were some of the crazier ideas that you'd come up with? What? When you were when you were spitballing in your brain? I don't even remember. I because yeah. I was approached with this idea uh, through uh, the British Council of Canada, who organized everything, um, and I really didn't think I had any time. So I, I thought I was coming in um, to kind of you know fire up some ideas and, and maybe get some other poets that I knew, um, but then it just sounded so good that I ended up going, oh, okay, I want, I want to do that. I want to go to Scotland, sure. I want to, but you wanted to go up north, right? Yeah. I seem to remember you wanting to go into the Arctic. And when, when, what time of year was this again? April, May. April, May? Okay. Yeah, we ended up in April. It was minus 20. Yeah, the, it, was mi- it was minus 40 with oh. the wind chill. Yeah. <laughs> It was That's winter. Too cold. That's too cold. It was winter. <laughs> I, every every surface of my skin was was completely covered, um, oh or it would literally have like frozen off. <laughs> <laughs> and Winnipeg get like our winters are very cold, and minus yeah. forty is is quite normal. But this was but we melt at the beginning of April. So I thought so my winter my body felt winter was over, and then we went up <laughs> to Churchill and. You know, I got sick immediately because it was just protest. It was just viral <laughs> protest going, yeah. no, it's over. <laughs> it's done now. I was striding about <laughs> the whole time. You loved it. <laughs> you were like, this is great. I'm like, this is this is Tuesday, and every Tuesday in February. You know, it's why, cold. Hey, why, did, why did you take to it so well, do you think? <laughs> well... Churchill is literally on a latitude with Orkney, so it's the same. It's the same degrees north as Orkney. And originally, I had this. It's subarctic rather than Arctic. And originally, I had suggested that I might go north to Iqaluit, which is properly Arctic. But I think ending up tracing the Orcadian route um, was a bit more fruitful for my work, which was good. And um, it is a lot colder than Orkney, but I think kind of striding around uh, a, a town with lots of prefabricated buildings in blistering wind. Uh, and ex-military bases is is kind of home <laughs> to me. It's just was yeah, like, recognizes that. that. Genuinely, yeah. well, it's home to me. Um, it's just here. It was covered with snow and even colder, yeah. um, and has a completely different culture. But but there are elements of it that actually felt really familiar. Well, you found a lot of connection mm-hmm. to, with with mm-hmm. all the Scottish or, or- Orcadian or- even. Or- so literally half the names in in Churchill are. Um, or Arcadian, of Arcadian origin. Like, I, I walked through the graveyard and over half of the names, it was Omond and Spence and Flett and Sinclair and all of these names that I knew from home. And it was the same in, my, in Winnipeg, actually. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And, and, and that, was that eerie for you? What was, what's that? What's that, that that's a very strange place mm-hmm. to be in with those layers, isn't it? Mm-hmm. I think there's a thing about names that really brings history home, especially, I think names and words just have this, like, really deep... They get they get right into your gut and 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 so to see the names and to know that that the names are there because of this huge historical epoch and and an extremely destructive epoch that my home is part of that kind of that really brings it home for me. And and we found out in our research that you know the Scottish actually made Canada. <laughs> there is there's, there's books. Dedicated. Ken McGugan isn't here, is he? <laughs> Okay, as long as Ken McGugan isn't here, that's okay. So there's a there's a there's an. I took a picture of it. It was a nice slideshow. Oh, there, there's a there's a little cottage industry of like.
Vermont, or it's southern Ontario, which was primarily Scottish and, and a little bit of Irish, a little bit of British, but very, very orange. Um, and these like these bits of because because of how how, how settler colonization works, these bits of like British politics and history kind of get brought over. And so so I was reading into um, the history of Louis Riel and the Riel rebellions, which is like like primary school history for a lot of a lot of Canadians, but totally new for me. And and Louis Riel on the one hand is 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 fighting off orange men, like literally who are literally referred to as With orange men. Bare hands. <laughs> and on the other hand he also worked um, for the government um, trying to put down a, 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 a military situation that was known as the Fenian Raids. Yes. Which was when Irish immigrants to well, settlers to um, the U.S. came across the Canadian border and started raiding Canada for Irish independence, and so this was happening at the same <laughs> at the same time. Yeah, this is wild west. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's, it's it's hilarious because yeah, it, um, Lou Riel is is my ancestor. He's a member of the Métis Nation. He's probably the most famous Métis um, in Canada, and he was instrumental in bringing um, Manitoba into Confederation. Uh, of Canada, because um, back in the day, Canada, up until about 1870, Canada only consisted of Ontario and uh, and Quebec. And then, as they were pushing forward towards the Pacific Ocean, they were buying up all that land for for a railroad um, from the Hudson's Bay Company, who had bought it all up for the fur trade, which is where all the Scottish uh, original settlers had come over. Um, I love this history. <laughs> so, um, so, so Louis Riel actually was fighting for the Métis Nation as well as the other Indigenous nations, as well as the um, the and uh, um, the people who were descended from the fur trade, uh, those European settlers who um, really just wanted a say in how they came into Confederation, but all of the Orangemen and settlers from Ontario basically wanted to just take over everything. Um, so. So it was all it was Scottish against Métis in a very real way. And then, from my perspective, also, um, in as I was reading into into this bit of history, um, a number of uh, members of Riel's provisional government um, and future politicians in in Manitoba were the children of Orcadians. So, so there's there's John Norquay who becomes the premier of Manitoba. There's a yep. number of, of Orkney names in this as well, and it's they're all bound up in this history on both sides. Yeah. You would have expected this before. You, how much did you, of this were you aware of before you set set off uh, on the trip? Only like the vaguest outline, and none of the the detailed history. Um, there. Um, we, I mean, Orkney knows about this because this is part of the depopulation of, of Orkney, um, a, a period of economic struggle, near famine in some places, and, and that's why a lot of men were, were leaving Orkney. So we know that lots of people went over to Canada and most of them didn't come back in some form. Some of them did. Um, we have museum. We have a museum that's full of artefacts from the early days of the Hudson Bay Company. We know about John Ray, who is a, an Orkney-born explorer who was instrumental in a bunch of stuff around the Franklin expedition. So we know these bits of stuff, but we tend to have the the celebratory stuff and the the, the history that's that's really focused on um, what happened with settlers and not what happens in indigenous communities, um, not what happens in something like the Real Rebellion and our involvement in that in various ways. So I only have the biggest outline and it tends to be at the kind of the lauded end of it. And also like just as I'm going over to to, to, to Winnipeg and Churchill to try and trace Orkney there, we get loads of people from Canada that would like root through graveyards yeah. and <laughs> church records and registry offices looking for their long lost ancestors. And, yeah. and how was the how was the conversation to talk? So, because you're you, you've got a broad outline, but you've got the details and you've got that history and you know these stories very well. How how was it easy to have that conversation as you were traveling? Did you find? I think it was very easy. Well, we talked about many many things. It was very easy to have those conversations, and I don't know that I'm necessarily someone who knows a lot about all of the. Um, interconnections. I've studied Métis history and I'm doing a lot of projects around Métis history, which is my own history, or my own people's history. Um, so really there's always these interconnections. Um, things like um, the Scottish, or the Selkirk settlers who came over in 1817 um, and founded Winnipeg. Again, thank you. Um, that, that was really interesting to me because that was always something, it was, it was a huge clash between, it was the first um, kind of permanent settlement 
in a very indigenous community. Um, so it was really kind of that, that finding of Canada that was really interesting. But then we were talking about Lord Selkirk and the reason why mm -hmm. everyone was uh, taken off their land. Because in, in Canada, the story is always about Lord Selkirk was this amazingly philanthropic individual who just wanted the best for his people. So he put them on a boat and dropped them off in Churchill in the middle of winter. Um, and they had to walk to Winnipeg. Um, and just to get you an idea of what that distance is, it's about a two and a half hour plane ride. Um, <laughs> over tundra. <laughs> over tundra. And snow minus, minus 40. And there's a great big lake in between too that they had to go around. Um, so the, and then they actually, and then they arrived in Red River and, um, and it was really, um, in the early days of the settlement, it was this, it, this idea of clashing. Everyone kind of, um, it w tried to get along in ways that later on in history didn't happen. So there was this potential of, of something that I think was really, really interesting. But it was neat to look at it from different perspectives because I was very focused on, on one culture and not just all the other cultures that really fed into and, and became a part of Métis history in a lot of ways. Yeah, all right. That, that's yeah. fascinating. Can we maybe have a little bit of a reading from both mm -hmm. of you? Would that be all right? Um, I'm going first. You can. I mean, first. yeah, do it. Um, and you're happy as you're sitting, or would you like to stand and hold the mic? Right um, I'm happy sitting. I am running on about five hours sleep, so sitting is great. Um, and it was plain sleeping. Oh. Plain sleeping shouldn't count as real sleeping. Um, so part of what I was doing in, in my exploration, I've been, I've been exploring Métis history kind of in a broader sense, but also um, connecting it with my family um, and connecting kind of my roots and going through old family photographs. And a lot of these um, ideas really came with this time with Harry when we were on a train, because you know, there's not much to do on a train. You're, you're sitting and looking out the window mostly, and Ontario's just kind of evergreens, like straight through. Um, so it's really great for a poet to come up and think about these things. So um, I was thinking about different items around uh, Métis history, um, around the history of this country and how it was founded. And uh, this is where I came up with. I'm just wondering how much I have to explain this because it feels so Canadian-centric. You never really notice how centric Exercised you are to your nation until you go elsewhere and realize, yeah, no one's going to know what these things mean at all. Um, I'll start with Mitisaj. <laughs> this is very new. It's kind of the history of Canada in, in five parts. And Mitisaj is the, um, it's a French word. It's kind of, Métis is a, is a word that means mixed in French. Um, and it is the culture that um, arose out of uh, in indigenous and French culture as they were mixed together in the fur trade, you know, in various ways. Um, hopefully all good ones. Um, and also there was a lot of Scottish influence and a lot of Irish influence in our culture. We're very big on the fiddle. We think we invented Bannock. I know we did it. Um, so a métissage is that idea of the action, of métiness. So, one. My blood has been here forever, rooted as the river and just as in danger. This body has pounded prairie and pemmican, plotted and considered every hole and hill. We are nothing less than the whole stretched out sky, nothing more than the loose hair that dances within it. Two. Ontario goes on forever, a day and a half by train. Evergreens, an uninterrupted blur with only brief breaks for power lines, broken down houses, sky. It's easy to see how big they all thought it must be. Green seems to be never ending. It's easy to see how they thought they would never have to stop taking. Three. 
fur trade was the first industry brought. This country was made for it. Thick with brown bison, so huge their migrations indented the very prairie beneath them. But it only took 200 years to hunt them near extinction. The beaver skinned for trendy top hats until they too went out of style. And the sea otters have never been seen since. It only took 200 years to have so little left so many first peoples starved, hung out to dry too long, like the once priceless skins now sold for pennies. Next was the railroad, easier to make in a country, not a colony, so nationalism was born. Canada bought this country from the Hudson's Bay for next to nothing, and the empty excess was sold for more. Four. It is not history. It is not past. There is nothing to get over. It is still happening. This land is still used up for all it can give. We have an oil sand field that's bigger than all of Scotland. Every river is mined somehow for hydro. Earth and water polluted by commercial farms and that evergreen of Ontario is being cut down faster than it can be sold. It is not history, it is still happening. And like the land, the First Peoples are used up for all we can give. Five, my blood has been here forever. As rooted as the river and just as in danger, these bodies have pounded prairie and pemmican, plotted and considered every hole and hill. We are nothing less than the whole stretched out sky, nothing more than the loose hair that dances in it. Our blood has been here forever, as long as the land and just as unprotected. Yeah, so I got really political. You kind of do that when you're when you're exploring history. I don't know. You you do that. <laughs> okay, Harry and I do that. Anyone else? Yeah. You um. You really start to see patterns. And how things don't change. I'm trying to find. I'll do this one. So part of what I'm doing is, and this was one of those epiphanies that came on the train, is looking at, I love looking at old photographs. Um, my grandfather died many years before I was born, so I only know him from pictures. Um, and he was a very proud man. Um, he was a very dark man, um, which is, was, a, was a struggle for his um, opportunities that was available to him. Um, and one, and he did many things, um, and for work. And one of the things that he did was uh, he made a lot of the roads that are in, um, in Manitoba. So Manitoba, like we're very young in, in many many ways, and we have a lot of roads and highways that were only cut through the bush less than a hundred years ago. Um, and of course, these aren't perfectly uh, straight roads like you think they would be because they're rounding around rocks and everything. So this is if it were a river. The road moves in and out of the bush, weaves bends, dissecting jack pine, cedar. Ever gray around stone, the road mimics the natural curves as if it were carved by them, as if it were a river. But there's nothing organic about the road. The trees were cut down, stumps pulled out, earth blasted open. Death cleared the bush. Death and tired brown men who worked for long hours and short pay, their lives impoverished by everything but air, space, bush. There was always too much bush. My grandfather did that, led a team of horses four wide to clear the trees, 
picked through rock, smoothing earth until flat. He lived in a camp all summer, tall canvas tent, cot, campfire and cigarettes every night. Short friendships with long stories. He'd return near the first snowfall, his back still dark from the sun and bent a little more each year. Dirt in the creases of his skin that never That was beautiful. Uh, Thank you. I can't believe, I couldn't believe you, you wrote those as you were going, I guess, and worked on them over the last four months. These are all very new. I was, yes, they're, they're very they're new, really like they're still scribbled on kind of thing. I noticed, but. Yeah, I noticed you had some edits. <laughs> <laughs> they're not, they're still evolving in a way, like I, yeah. Did they, did they change as, as you spoke to Harry? Was Harry's, was there an influence there? <laughs> because you were having these conversations. <laughs> And then just even in the sense that, like, Scotland was referenced. Would you normally say as big as Scotland, or is that I don't because think, you yeah, guys I think were we were talking a lot about Scotland, and we were talking a lot about, and it was really that evergreen of the Ontario um, that really, really started a lot of, um, and then, then we passed by this one house that, that said, that had this big sign that said, this is Canada. <laughs> <laughs> the house. <laughs> it was just a house in the middle of the bush. Like, and this is like the railroad tracks is quite, quite a ways north of the, like, the main highways. So there is nothing around but this, this train and the sign. This is Canada. You know, just in case we weren't sure. Um, so that's kind of where it, it really started. Lots of talking about nationalism and, and different uh, patterns of colonialism and how, how things are, are not um, considered and really just wiped over. And that seeped, so that seeped into the works from those conversations, that proximity yeah. to each other, the ideas that you were concerned with were coming in. I mean, it seems like you have very overlapping ideas and ways of writings and processes. Yeah. And I think that that, that land, and, um, land and original peoples kind of idea, like the, the endangerment of the land and the endangerment of indigenous peoples, I think that's, that's a very global, um, that's a phenomenon is not the right word, it's a very global problem. Um, and it's something that we were also talking about in re reference to Scotland and how, like you, comparatively, it seems like you have such a small amount of land and that it, any part of it would be misused seems like a travesty. Yeah, but. I, I just love hearing you talk about the whole trip and then just feeling it in the poems, and it's very elegantly done. It's not like a travel log, but you can still, you get that. I know, it's really nice. Yeah. Yes. Thank you. <laughs> That's Thank a compliment. You. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Harry, would you, would you sure. read for us, please? Yeah, absolutely. Um, all right, so I should, I should do this thing. How is, is, that, is that sound volume good for everyone, including recording people? Um, so I, I made... I made one long poem out of this um, trip. Which are we? Are we? Have we still got some for the for this room? Somebody from the book festival. Is that a thing that's still happening? Oh, good. Um, so, so in some form, you'll you'll be able to get a copy of one of these. Maybe somebody will, will say at the end. And it'll also be it's also be freely available online. Um, so the poem's called Traveler's Lexicon, and it's in the it's in the form of a, a lexicon. Uh, like, you know, in the back of your rough guide where there's like a, a list of key phrases that you need to, right, it's like that. Um, and I'll maybe just read like the first third of it. What was, <laughs> aside from the beauty of the, the poetry, there were particular conversations that we had that I could hear in those poems. And some of those conver same conversations have cropped up in this, which was kind of fascinating. Um, and in the back of this, I've tried to track like 
particular places where I've picked up words or ideas, but inevitably there's like, this is, this is like a collage, I suppose. Anyway, I'll just read it. Traveler's Lexicon. Adventure. Journey in which there is an expectation of high return on investment in exchange for high risk of horror. <laughs> Airport. Specific form of sovereignty over time and space. Airport light is the light you are given on a wet dawn. Airport air is the air that comes packaged in gentle pellets protecting your new. Aurora. Maybe if we launch enough rockets on enough columns of fire with enough fine instruments between them, we could learn how to turn these lights off and on. Or maybe if you tap your teeth. Bannock. Unleavened bread, whose familiar sounds rest wholly different on your tongue. I meant to bring you a bannock from Orkney, and I forgot, but I'm going to try and get one posted down before you leave. Because <laughs> it's very different. Very different. <laughs> Belief. Always respect the gods of the temple and don't mess with magic you don't understand. Bush. Small forest, low forest, or forest informally, rainforest or desert. Country, the country, the country that is what is not the city, what is outside of. Camera, yourself seen as if by another, which is no longer the only way you see it. See mirror. Card, marker of rights, including but not limited to admittance, cash, and speech. On occasion, literally carried in folded le leather next to your literal heart. Ceremony, that's not for you. Clear, to remove complications. Commonwealth, one, belonging to everyone. Two, retaining empire. Constitution, your limits. Roll two dice. Cousin, the word unwinds from your fingers onto the keys as if it can carry across ocean, history, or pressure differential a thread of meaning. Crow, bigger than you are used to, her cry more human. See robin, sparrow, stake. Design, one, to remember, two, to forget. Discover, to cover. Diversity. One, everyone loves me now, but they still want to kill me. Two, everyone loves me now, but I still hate myself. Empathy. To hold your hand against a lung fire and then to describe with care your particular blisters, aware that these blisters are not the only blisters, and indeed to press with tenderness these blisters against another, another's and to hold that pain. Endless. Here, you begin to understand how the vastness appeared to someone from an island like yours, five miles by three in each fractal edge of shore with its own name, the few low trees personally known, and you find yourself using untrue words like endless and boundless, the way your Google calendar appears to have infinite space for activity where a paper diary would expose your overcommitment in the cramp of its lines. That is, you see in this space that, that within you which desires expansion, which reads stories on a galactic scale and has always preferred the story of an infinite universe to that of an expanding sphere. And just as everything is determined by what it excludes, you see also the terror and blood of your desire to keep expanding beyond your own skin while a raven flies over the carriage and the leaning trees continue. Exhaust, to have nothing left, and to be so full that nothing can enter, and the shallow breath you give off in this state. Explore, to scout the hunting area for game by means of loud cries, and or to make to flow outwards, see adventure. Facebook, where everything happens. Farm, to clear enough space to gather enough light. See clear. Festival, cultural form which celebrates certain spheres of migrant labor for the purpose of obscuring others. First, when you say it, it never is. Freight, everyone is behind us pushing us forward. Golf, 
Noun, the erasure of land. Verb, to declare the erasure of land. Grain. We hold 140,000 tons in the complex and can load 1,000 tons an hour. Our gantry leans to the right with courage over the ice. Gritty. This is stolen straight from Katerina. I did credit you, though. <laughs> Gritty, what you become when you write about a street. Guilt, less useful still than his sister's shame. See, shame. Hello, a performative utterance conveying, depending on the melody, one, I only speak English, two, I am asking whether you speak English, three, I am requiring that you speak English, four, I have chosen not to learn how to greet you in the language of this polity. Hot, caution, may refer to radically different temperatures in different geographies, may cause ice or sunburn as it coughs from the tap. Home, where you claim from, where all seek to claim, where claims. Thanks, thanks, Anne. That was good. Would you do me a favor, though? Would you just would you just read Lake for me, please? Oh, uh, sure. That was about the first third. Um, there's some longer bit. Uh, no, I didn't get to. L. Uh, uh, oh yeah, Lake. Large. <laughs> that's a hot poem. <laughs> Good. Uh, yeah, that's, that was fascinating. What, and I love the difference in styles between what you both made, but again, speaking to that, having that same conversation, it's really fantastic to hear that. Um, what, what the idea of the lexicon, where did that come from? Was that something kicking around in your head? I know that you, you, you write in, I guess, Scots or Acadian yeah. as well. So, was that something that had been in your mind for a while, and why did it get put here? Or did that come about as you were traveling? It just, um, this is, I know this is a cop-out answer, but it just right. emerged from the things that I was writing, that I was writing little sketches of ideas, little bits of poems, and then at some point in, in it, I thought, oh, this is, this is a lexicon, isn't it? And, and I, I didn't know I was gonna do that. And then once, I, once that form had announced itself, the rest of the poem, shaped itself around it. I know that makes me sound really like a mystic, but... No, no, it doesn't. No, because you're, of course, because you're because. traveling and you're going <laughs> to... Yeah. Especially when you're talking and you're with somebody, I yeah. find it really hard to write uh, during that process mm. or to write on command or, like, mm. write that fast. And that's... I would lean I would lean that way. I thought it was a really good way to... Yeah, I mean, I think it is partly a product of, of traveling and, and writing in bits and writing in, in stolen moments in that the, the result can come out frag fragmentary. Although this, I mean, this did take like four months to, to kind of polish <laughs> together. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. That's fast. I mean, that's fast yeah. turnaround for a poem. Yeah. I, uh, yeah. I mean, at least in yeah. my mind, I don't know how... It, no, 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 that's, right. that's right, yeah. Um, tell us, tell, I was reading through your blog and, and there was a moment um, where you talked, somebody was talking about apology. And I'd like I'd like to talk about apology. It was um, oh, is that the quote was the role of apology mm. in the world about good and bad apologies? And I wanted to hear about what you thought or both of you think about good and bad apologies in the context of this journey and Ooh. why it's important. Okay, dig right in there, man. Thanks. Okay, sure. Well, um, someone had not apologized. We were talking. Sorry, I'm totally... Yeah, wrong. I can't remember what triggered the conversation. It was one of those n politician non-apologies. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I don't remember but which then it one, ends, though. But the yeah, there was ends so the many. About the freedom from denial. Freedom, right, so this the, is... Um, what she's looking for from the... F first, from the cl colonizing world, i.e. Yeah. Uh, us, uh, is freedom from denial. Yeah, so to, to, ground, to ground what Ryan's talking about, I wrote a blog as I did this... Um, journey has it's about 10,000 words of it very so you, diligently you, you don't have to read the whole thing but again that's on online and you can I find several most of pictures this. of Harry <laughs> working um, and um, one thing I was listening to during the journey was a conversation uh, between the poet Lely Long Soldier um, and the broadcaster Krista Tippett um, on her podcast which is called On Being um, and Lely Long Soldier has written an extraordinary book called uh, Whereas which I highly recommend um, and it is a response to um, 
I think it was Obama's, uh, signed off on an, an apology to the indigenous peoples of what is now the US. Um, but it was re the apology was really buried. I think it was buried in a military appropriations bill. And there was no like public acknowledgement. And nobody knows that this happened. It was about three or four years ago. Um, or rather, some people know that it happened. But a lot of the people that should know don't. Um, and Lady Long Soldier wrote this book-length response called Whereas. Um, and it's, it's about apology and the role of apology in life and looking at this practice of apology, which, which is now a, a political movement. We've just um, pardoned everyone who was criminalized for homosexuality and that's supposed to make everything better now, right? And we're supposed to like, be grateful for apologies. And they, these, these political apologies, they are necessary, and, like, but you can do them really badly or you can do them well. And in the end, they can often center the person apologizing, <laughs> which in itself is a problem. And what does freedom from denial mean, I guess? Yeah. Well, what, what Lily Long Soldier said, and that's, that's a direct quote from her um, in the conversation, is that often these conversations around genocide, which is what we're talking about, from the, when, from the settler perspective, which is my perspective, um, can center around guilt and shame. And when you talk about stuff like genocide, then, then people start getting really guilty and awkward and, and shameful about it. And you can't do anything with that. Like, maybe feeling guilt and shame is necessary, but it doesn't do anything. Um, and what she said is really the first step, the first thing that she's looking for is not guilt and shame, but freedom from denial. That facing the truth of, of, of these things is at least the first thing to do. Maybe you have to start by just listening. I don't know. I'll stop rambling. <laughs> I like that. And that's new. Yeah. Because I remember it in context of that, that idea about apology and how apology just um, becomes another form of political rhetoric that really is as empty as, as anything else. Um, in Canada, we had the uh, residential school apology that mm -hmm. happened in 2008 um, by uh, Prime Minister at the time, Stephen Harper. Uh, thankfully, no longer our Prime Minister. Um, there was also a very similar apology uh, for, um, you know, genocide and, you know, hunting people for skins and killing everyone in Australia. Um, Again, it's this idea that everything's better now, we've acknowledged, but what happens with acknowledgement is there's, it stops there, as if acknowledgement actually mm -hmm. does anything, um, where, you know, policy or action or change, you know, might actually do something. Um, because, you know, Stephen Harper, um, for those of us who are familiar with anything in Canada, actually then, post-apology, ended up subsequently creating every policy um, to, to uh, take away rights deny rights, deny um, land claim, um, anything he could do to uh, oppress Indigenous rights um, until he was finally elected out um, two years ago. Mm. So really the idea that apology means very little. And even now in Canada with our, our cute little Trudeau, <laughs> yes. um, who's supposed to be like this beacon of liberalism, <laughs> is hair. a staunch supporter of the oil industry yes. of, of pipelines, which which are based on the theft of indigenous land, and that's that's what they are. It's theft and murder. And it's not only the the theft of, of uh, indigenous land, and and it's also the unacknowledgement of the sovereignty of mm. indigenous land, because these pipes um, are very very expensive and have to go uh, the shortest distance possible to get to wherever it is they're going. And uh, the idea of indigenous land, First Nations communities, um, in Canada we have six hundred and twelve. First Nations communities, and we have several more, um, about 300 more Métis communities, um, that are acknowledged as being a sovereign land. They do not belong to Canada. They do not belong to anyone other than the band that operates and lives on them. Um, but that is something that's repeatedly threatened, and it's very much threatened whenever any kind of industry, um, and Canada has many different industries that, that threaten that because it um, becomes about money. And this, I think, I mean, this came up in your poem, the fact that we're not talking about a historical period, we're talking about now, we're talking about continuing colonization. And that's a continuing colonization that, that Scotland continues to be part of. So for one example, um, one of the major investments in the Alberta tar sands, um, which is environmentally one of the most destructive things on the planet, and also, again, based in the denial of, of sovereignty, um, one of the major investments is, investors is the Royal Bank of Scotland. We continue to profit from extracting from the land. And also, it has an ongoing effect on our 
our political situation. So one of the reasons I would argue, and I'm not a good enough historian to be able to properly stand up for this, but one of the reasons that Scotland's got one of the most unequal systems of land distribution in Europe, and we do have an extraordinarily unequal system of land distribution, um, is, is because whether an area was depopulating or whether it was forcibly cleared, as in whether people were starved or burned out of their homes in Scotland, the reason that we, we didn't have as much fight for land rights here is because people went over to the Americas and took land there instead. And the, the opportunity to be part of the settler colonial project the opportunity to be part of that is why we didn't fight for the rights in, in Scotland and why we've got the land system that we do now and continue to have this bizarre system of land ownership. All right. <laughs> yes. We did say that we got political we, when we looked no, at history. Not just political, but I mean, it ties back into what you were saying about connections and the way yeah. it all is coming together. And I can see how active that's really kicked off in your mind. Yeah. To, to, you've gone to a place that you didn't necessarily expect to get to, I think. <laughs> well, I was, uh, no, I was already there politically, but now I feel a bit more informed and I had an opportunity to do a lot more listening, which is the more important thing. Um, yeah. Speaking of listening, you guys have all been excellent <laughs> listeners. Excellent. Um, and now it's time to put your hands up and ask some questions. So if anybody would like to speak, um, that's great. We've got a question there. Um, do we have somebody bringing microphones, or I can do it? Are you sure? Is this, uh, this woman there? Well, well, thank you very much. I very much enjoyed it. Um, I wanted to ask you, though, about what you thought about the Outrider project. And in particular, because you were generous enough to give us these books before the start, I was reading Jenny Niven's introduction, which said, Travelling along predetermined routes, devised with the help of local export spurts, blah, blah, blah. And I just wondered what you felt about the predetermined routes, and whether if one was actually exploring the impact of travel, <laughs> that whether one would be looking at not predetermined routes. <laughs> Do you want me to go first? Shall I go first? You can go first. Um, <laughs> woof. Okay, I mean, obviously, like, the great green beard in the sky has condemned me to environmentalist hell for this project. Like, that's, that's <laughs> fairly transparent. But um, fortunately, individual action doesn't really accomplish much anyway, and only collective resistance will, will end climate change. So I'm not going to feel too guilty about that. Um, you did take a train. You did take a very long train ride. Yeah, I suspect <laughs> the... Anyway, anyway. I, I, I think I clocked about 10,000 miles of flying, so I, 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 I'm, a, I'm a sinner. Um, but I think the, the political dimension of it is a bit more interesting um, to look at. And, and, and this, this, I've been pretty upfront about this in the planning of it, and it also comes up in this poem that, um, for me, um, art is uh, part of uh, settler colonial politics. That, 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 that going somewhere to extract stories is, is, an, <laughs> is, is part of the same model. And I, didn't want, I wanted to avoid replicating that behavior as much as possible and knowing that I'm buying into, into some of that <sighs> as well. So that, that concerned me. That's what concerned me about, about um, Outriders is sending sending five people over to Scotland to extract stories, yeah. and and I think each of us has responded to that challenge in a different way to try and not do that. Um, but I don't know; only the the results can say whether that happened or not. Yeah. Did you feel <laughs> like you were being extracted? <laughs> uh, uh, extracted? Um, no, not well. No, um, I. <laughs> No, and I'm not familiar enough with the other projects to know um, like how, how it might look comparatively. I think we, we, we would, everybody seemed to have different adventures. Um, we all kind of explored America. I think we all kind of got political, yeah. I'd venture to say. Um, but we're poets, and that kind of happens. And writers. Um, uh, I really felt like I had a lot of say in what was going on. Um, and and that, that's, you know, control is always always helpful when you're being extracted. Um, but it felt like I was very much, ex and I was very much on my home turf. Um, and very, like we spent a few days in Winnipeg where I was literally exploring as, as a tourist would, you know, and really um, seeing things in a different way, like the, the grand monument to the Selkirk settlers. 
Um, they're shirtless, by the way. <laughs> they're 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 beautiful creatures <laughs> who had walked. Well, so he is. She's very modestly covered up. It's true. She's yeah. very modestly covered up. There's a twin of it in Helmsdale, by the way. So you, really? you yeah 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 in Scotland. So there's a twin of there's a statue in Winnipeg and a statue in Helmsdale, Scotland, because of the site of the clearances there, and they're the same statue. Oh, yeah. nice. I didn't know that because yeah. that's like yeah, and then that's the kind of thing that I found um, fascinating, just to kind of see things just from a different perspective because you get you get very stuck in your own kind of line of inquiry um, so to kind of branch out of that and come back in was really fruitful so. it was a great question thank you very yeah. very much um, anybody else want to ask anything I think we've got time for a one one and a half question <laughs> uh, yes ma'am we, we yes, were late oh okay, you got it sorry I'm half a question though <laughs> <laughs> yeah. just to say I'm from Scotland but originally it's interesting that I actually travelled in BC and Haida Gwaii nice. and then came back here and realised I'd never been to Old Pale Shetland <laughs> or the Outer Hebrides. <laughs> so I'm now doing them. Nice. But actually going up to Orkney and, and seeing some of the resources there, I, I think they're really interesting to learn from. I wondered, are you taking any of, of this back to Orkney to try and complete the circle? And hopefully help them in some way because I think part of, of what should happen now is reconciliation okay I, uh, I would generally go for <laughs> reparation rather than reconciliation because I think some things are in irreconcilable um, I also think that, that that kind of happens at a political level rather than at a, an individual level but um, in terms of in terms of taking stuff back to Orkney a lot of some of this work has, has happened already like I'm not the, the first person to be doing there's actually um, I wish I could remember I wish I could remember who built it there is um, there's now a there's now a, a, a totem pole in uh, on the Orkney mainland who is it that built it it was actually Betty Peak oh was it yeah. oh yeah who, who was it Oh, okay. Uh, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So I'd be interested. Yeah. I would be interested in that because totem poles are very specific. Yeah. To to the west coast region, so um, that's interesting. And they they've they've done a lot of national projects where they've yeah. built totem poles. So so these place. conversations are already happening, and they're happening in in Orkney already. Um, and uh, and people, yeah, are starting to. And uh, I'm I one. The one thing that I'm trying to do is connect people in Churchill with people in Orkney who are literally cousins, um, <laughs> third or wow. fourth cousins. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I'm doing some of that work and trying to make like you Facebook. trying to make that happen. <laughs> um, I think Orkney is actually a, ahead of a lot of Scotland in in acknowledging this, and that partly become comes from our own peripheral position. It partly comes from knowing the history better than a lot of Scotland. Um, and because it was so central to our economy for for a hundred years or so, mm -hmm. um, you want to move on to the next question? No, I think we <laughs> I'm happy to chat about to, it more. We actually have to um, close the session because it's uh, uh. time. Everybody, it went by really fast. You guys were both fantastic. I really appreciate it. I'm sure everybody does. I want to say an apology because during the introduction, I uh, accidentally used the incorrect pronoun. Yeah. I'm really sorry, and that's genuine and sincere. Um, Anybody wants to ask both of them questions, uh, we're going to be in the signing tent. Uh, you've got your free Outrider book. The con conversation and the journey will continue. Um, please join me in giving them a very big round of applause for being so generous. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. We'll see you over at the adult bookshop. <laughs>